Hey everyone and welcome to Co Blueprint. I'm Jeanette Mulvey, the editor of Co from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. With a renewed public focus on racial justice, many businesses are taking a new look at how they can make their teams more inclusive and diverse, even while managing through this global pandemic. So today that's what we're talking about. How can you grow an inclusive and diverse team? And more importantly, how doing that can help you improve your bottom line and your business in general. We'll be talking to two experts and two small business owners who will share their strategies and insights on how they're doing that. So before I introduce them to you today, a few housekeeping notes. First, we wanna know how you're feeling about things right now. So in a word or two, tell us, what is the main factor driving your diversity and inclusion efforts at your business? You can tell us the answer on the right side of your screen anytime during the next few minutes, and we will reveal the results later in the program. Secondly, we will be taking your questions for our panelists later in the event. So type them in the right-hand side of the screen at any time during the event. And if you see one that you like, be sure to hit the thumbs up button so I know which ones are the most popular. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business, as well as our supporting sponsors, ADP, FedEx, MetLife, and Square. And we also want to thank our chamber partner today, the Greater Boston Chamber. We're thrilled to highlight voices from that region today. So first I'd like to introduce you to our experts for today's discussion. We have Michelle Grace, who is Manag Managing Director, South Division Director, Chase Business Banking. And we have Tiffany Hauser, who is, hi, Tiffany Hauser, who is a transformational leadership coach and founder and CEO of Evolve. So welcome, Michelle and Tiffany. So Michelle, I'd like to start with you. Um, so the movement for racial justice is in the spotlight right now, as we know, um, and it's renewed businesses focus on ensuring that they're running an inclusive business. So just tell us a little bit how that's actually playing out at Chase specifically. Yeah, I mean, first of all, inclusion is one of those things that just doesn't show up on our report, right? Um, you can't measure it necessarily by reporting. Um, and so for us at the firm, we're being really intentional around inclusion. Um, we still have employees that are still working from home and that can be pretty lonely at times. And you also lose connection with them that you might have just by walking by their desk or their office. And so, um, you know, as leaders, we tend to be really good problem solvers, um, but we need to be really good listeners right now. And so, you know, listening more actively, learning continuously um, and leading even in the face of being uncomfortable because silence just isn't an option for us right now. Great, thanks, Michelle. Hi, Tiffany, how are you? Great, thank you, Jeanette. Right. Um, I love that um, right before we started, I asked you how I should introduce what you do and you said the word transformational and I'm glad that you said that because I think that actually really ties into what we're talking about today, which is that um, I don't think this is a new way of thinking for businesses, but it is transformational, it seems like at this moment. So we use the words diversity and inclusion a lot, but I think we use them so much that sometimes we don't stop and think about what do they really mean. So when you are advising small businesses, how do you help them even think about what diversity and inclusion actually means for them? Yeah, that's such a great question. And we start with the fundamentals. So we actually have them describe it. What does diversity mean for you? And what does inclusion mean for you and the vision that you have for your business, your people, and your customers and clients? So we start with their interpretation and their, um, their definition, and then we go into, well, what is your vision? So after they define it, then we step into, well, what is your vision? What do you want to cause and create by having a diverse and inclusive um, uh, company, people experience? And we also uh, work on equity as well. So can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean? I mean, I think I know what you mean by equity, but can you be more specific about what, what you mean? Yeah, um, you know, equality is is something we're we used we're used to hearing, and so when we extract that and pull that out further to equity, it's really creating the end result that everyone is equal. So when we think of equality, we 
tend to roll out a process or a directive or a protocol for everyone. Yet, if if there isn't equality and we're rolling something out as a blank, as you know, an all encompassing, it won't create equity, which is everyone is equal. So equity is the final result. Equality, well, equality is the final result, and equity is how we get there. Making sure that everyone is getting what they need to get to equality, rather than the blanket approach. This is what we're going to do for all women, all people, you know, all POCs, all you know, any other categories there might be. So, are you saying that if people don't all start out at the same level, then instituting a uh, company-wide policy doesn't impact everyone the same because they didn't start out in the same place. Is that kind of, you have to address each person's situation individually. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah. And, and I know for the listeners who just heard that are like, whoa, each individual, yet there are uh, streamlined ways to create that. And yes, it is an individual approach that um, we look at through the lens of the whole. So seeing where, and again, it's based off of their definition and then their vision of what, what it means and what they want to cause and create as being a diverse, inclusive, and equitable firm or organization. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. So, Michelle, I'm going to come back to you, and I want to talk first a little bit more about Chase. And I know that you guys had a lot of programs in place already. So as this renewed focus on equity and racial justice and equality and inclusion and diversity has been happening lately. How has that been playing out at Chase in terms of how you guys are looking at your own programs? And then I'll I'll ask you a follow-up question about that after you answer that. Yeah, well, um, first, diversity and inclusion needs to be just as important as your sales goals and your customer service goals. And so we have made that an equal importance for everyone. And, you know, we've put forth resources um, for our employees. Um, We're giving it the attention that it really needs right now. And not just because it's important right now, but how do we drive the change in that for the future? Um, And, you know, I'll just say when your employees feel valued, appreciated, heard, respected, they'll treat our customers in the same way. And so it has to be just as equally important as everything else that's driving your business. Right, so that's what's happening at Chase. Now tell me a little bit more. You're you're in two roles here, right? Because you're thinking about what's happening at your own company, but you're also serving your clients who are small businesses. So tell me a little bit more about what what your and Chase's perspective is on why it's valuable for small businesses to be also focusing their own resources on building um, diverse and inclusive teams. Like, how does it help them serve their customers better? What are you advising small businesses on that front? Yeah, well, a couple things. So kind of going back to what I said around like you treat your employees with respect and dignity and um, you want them to be heard, then your customers will feel the same way. But also your customers want to go to places where they're represented too. So um, if you don't have a diverse team, your customers aren't going to feel welcome necessarily in the same way they would if they were able to go into a business where they're represented in the same way. And so if I could say to our our businesses out there, you know, um, I said it in the beginning that it has to be just as equally important and you need to put forth the resources that will help you get there. Whether if if you're, um, you know, maybe you're underrepresented in, in black or female, or you don't feel like there's an inclusive environment, like people literally just come to work and go home and they, don't really bring themselves to work every day and you don't know enough about your your coworker, all of that stuff really matters to the customers. Customers can feel what it's like to walk into one of our branches and have like a cohesive environment where folks really care about each other. Um, It feels more genuine and organic. And when you put the forth the focus around that, your customers will feel it too. So for me, that's, the most important thing that I could share with all the business owners out there. Great. Thank you. So Tiffany, sort of a similar question for you. How do your clients see the importance of inclusiveness in terms of them serving their customers? 
Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, 2020 has served, um, served up a lot. <laughs> so, you know, we saw a new category pop up, which is the at home parent. So that, that in and of itself was a new way to actually embrace, okay, now we understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're not a, a department or, you know, a team that we just, you know, assembled. It's the bigger picture now, because as we become agile and adapt to where we are right now and where we're going, so are our clients. We're all in this together. And that's really what uh, the pandemic showed a lot of companies that as you're shifting and uh, making changes that this is exact and you actually created space to have these, you know, as Michelle said, these genuine and organic conversations of being in the same boat um, around this. So it, it's created a lot of uh, rapport and a lot of relationship building during this time because we're all in this together. Um, specifically around, you know, we're working remote and now we have this new category of the working parent and homeschooling or whatever that looked like. Yeah, inclusive really has come to mean really people's whole extended lives and circumstances, right? Yeah. Um, so Michelle, this, I think anyone who's tuned in to this event is clearly already illustrating that they're interested in this topic. But I guess the question is, during a, this pan, small businesses are always struggling to make it, right? Mm -hmm. And then now we're in a pandemic. So they're really struggling to keep to, to keep it going. So can you just talk a little bit more about why during this time, this still needs to be a focus, even though maybe you're just struggling to get the doors open every day? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And to your point, you know, a lot of the businesses are struggling to open back up and what does that even look like for them, right? Um, and I realized that, you know, for small businesses, you know, you're focusing on inventory, customers, logistics, um, and your people have gone through a lot. Your employees have gone through a lot right now. Um, it's a perfect time before, you know, maybe some of them coming back to the office, maybe some of them aren't, but it's a perfect time to set aside, you know, a quality conversation with your employee and to ask them, how are they feeling? How are they doing? It might be really uncomfortable for some folks, right? You might not uh, be comfortable asking someone how they're doing. And um, it's okay for them to say, I'm not doing well right now. I have a lot on my mind. You know, my, I've got kids that are in school and dogs will need to be walked and, you know, trying to run my business at the same time and, and be a good employee. Um, but there's struggles for them as well. And so, um, making sure that you're opening up with a dialogue for them to feel safe um, is just such an important thing for them. And, and as you're focusing on opening back up or continuing to run your business, your people are the most important thing for you. Um, and they need to make sure that, that again, they have a voice and that they're heard and, and that you care about what their struggles are right now. Um, you know, we have a lot of check-ins with our employees right now. We're having a lot of uncomfortable conversations that quite frankly, even myself, um, have, I'm learning a lot about my people and, and what their struggles are. And I feel honored that they trust me with, with what they're going through and, um, surviving for them is, is is equally as important as surviving your your business surviving and and making sure that you know that you know what's going on in their home. Great, thanks, Michelle. So, Tiffany, I, I have a similar question to you about what your advice to small businesses is, but I want to before I let you answer, I want to be more specific in my question. When we're talking about inclusion and inclusivity and diversity, I mean. Very specifically, we're talking about trying to make sure that you have a team of people that has comes from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of life experiences, a variety of races or ethnicities or religions or genders or sexual orientations. We're talking about building a team that doesn't all look, act, live, think the same. So 
that is a tall order for a small business owner who is just trying to survive every day. So do you have some specific advice that you can offer small businesses about how to find, attract, hire, and then create equity for people who don't necessarily all look like them or yeah, people who, you know, who are not all the same. I think that it's easy for people to just meet the people they know in their regular everyday life and to never reach beyond that. So do you have some specific advice? Sorry, that was a very long question. But yeah. I to it because yeah, I, want and, to and I, I love the question because, you know, for the small business owner, resources matter. They want to keep it lean. They want to keep it smart. And so the, the small business owner looks for who's the best fit skill wise and who's the best return on investment. That tends to be like in the forefront yet when we only operate with that mindset, we tend to miss the the jewels or the gems that are in the diversity, um, the diversity piece. And I love how you highlighted um, the piece of thought, diversity of thought, because that's really what makes an, a diverse uh, company is when there's a diversity of thought, because then that's what cracks open creativity resourcefulness and innovation, which is where we are right now. We are all in a global pivot and even small businesses, you know, we get to, you know, open up the blinders and think creatively right now. And that's one of the values and benefits of inclusion, uh, excuse me, of diversity, diverse thoughts, diverse ways of being. So the specifics are redesign or transform your hiring process. So look at your job descriptions, look at the way you are choosing candidates, interviewing candidates, and really what their roles are. Look at the whole piece and it, are you looking at it holistically? And that's really you know, one of our key pieces of the work we do at Evolve is we work on transforming the onboarding. So you know, the, it costs so much for, for companies to hire, to find candidates, vet them, interview them, you know, and it may not be dollars so much, but the time that goes into that is costly for a lot of, especially for the entrepreneur or the small business owner. So with that, with the piece of, um, of the hiring, when you do your own work to see what is missing in my team Mm -hmm. or what would we like to add to our team? Because these things are working. And if we had this piece, maybe it's, rigor, maybe it's creativity, maybe it's um, risk taking, problem solving, maybe the, that's what we're missing. And you ask these questions or add it to your job descriptions and create what you're missing. So rather than doing it in the templated way, and that's the biggest blind spot we see in a lot of companies of all different sizes, is HR has gotten really templated. And we're not being inclusive or diverse in even our thinking and reimagining how we get to uh, attract the talent that would create a diverse and inclusive uh, environment for us. Great, thank you so much. So Michelle and Tiffany, I'm gonna introduce our small business owners now and we will be back to you guys when we do the audience Q&A. Um, Before I do, though, I just wanted to invite our audience to check out the resource links on the web uh, page below the the broadcast of this video. Um, You'll find lots of good information there. So now I would like to introduce Darren Bascombe, who is the founder of a Boston-based creative branding design and advertising agency called Prover, and Hadley Douglas, owner of the Urban Grape, a uh, curated wine store also in Boston. So welcome to Darren and Hadley. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you. Hi. So Hadley, I'm going to start with you. Um, I know that you are committed to running a business that is both inclusive and diverse. And um, maybe you could just tell us more about what that actually means for your business specifically. Absolutely. Well, it's hard to follow on on the heels of uh, Michelle and Robin, all those great um, bits of advice. But thanks for having me here. And thanks for um, promoting the small business perspective and all of this. Um, our store, The Urban Grape, it's my, I own it with my husband, um, and we are an interracial family. 
Um, so right from the beginning, we are in the wine industry, which is historically white and male, and we are a black owned and a woman owned company. So inclusivity really is the top down function of our business and something that's always been incredibly important to us. Um, one thing that I wanted to piggyback on in terms of not just building a, a diverse and inclusive team, but also for small businesses to think about building um, a diverse and inclusive customer base and also product offerings. I think that's just as important as having a team um, that is diverse. So for us, not only do we strive for diverse employees, but we also really strive to provide access points for people that um, in our customer base that might not typically feel welcome in the wine world. So we will go out of our way to bring in DNI groups from companies, to bring in LGBTQ groups, to go to wine tastings, to have uh, black women networking groups that come into our business. And that way we're signaling to everyone that this is a space that's for everyone. Um, also, in terms of the products that we sell, we are a tiny little store. We're just 2,000 square feet. We certainly can't uh, compete with the total wines of the world. And yet, in Massachusetts, we're the largest seller of Black-owned products. And we're also the largest seller of Mexican-owned wineries in Massachusetts. So I think it's really is about taking diversity and um, having that go into more than just your team having it be about your products, your producers, creates a lot of freshness and interest in your company. Yeah, thank you. So hi, Darren. Um, so we're talking a lot about diversity, but you know, I feel like I really wanna be specific about what that means for everyone. And so Hadley told us her story and I want, you've been really walking the talk on this for a long time. So just tell us your story and how you went about building your team to ensure that it was really reflecting all different sorts of people and perspectives. Sure. No, thank you for that. Um, you know, as as it's probably apparent, you know, I'm uh, you know I'm black. I'm, I'm also an immigrant. Uh, you know, I'm really tall and really skinny, and some might even say aggressively tall and skinny. Uh, but you know, those things are um, are also central uh, to my competitive advantage. Um, you know, uh, you know, being able to walk into environments and being able to bring you know, additional perspective. And for me, when I first started the company, and uh, I would say that that lack of belonging was one of the reasons why I uh, uh, launched Proverb, um, was that, you know, if you, you know, I, I worked on my own for about eight years. And, um, you know, if, if you work by yourself uh, and you're honest, one thing that you almost immediately uh, come up against, uh, you know, are your limitations, you know, the things that you're good at or excel at, you know, the things that you're not so good at, uh, you know, and you're always trying to figure out sort of how do you mitigate sort of in and around those things. And, you know, as uh, the business started to grow and the needs became more complex and I started to think a little bit about how do you expand the team, uh, you know, and that uh, initial point of expansion was in taking on a business partner and sort of uh, you know, and, and when Chris came into the business, you know, she brought additional perspective, uh, you know, but also, uh, you know, additional capacity. And, and so for us, uh, you know, as has been mentioned before, you know, we've really found that, uh, you know, bringing new thinking to pre-existing problems is one of the ways that you innovate consistently, uh, you know, and, and really sort of increase the likelihood of, uh, of that occurring, uh, you know, and so for us, uh, sort of whenever we're looking at, you know, adding, uh, you know, a new key hire or, you know, any additions to the team, you know, we're thinking about it both in terms of, you know, sort of skill set and function, um, but we're also thinking about sort of, you know, ways in which we can become a more effective company. And, you know, and that shows up, uh, you know, not just in terms of, you know, ethnicity or gender, but also thinking about age, thinking about, uh, you know, if you're in, introvert adding extroverts to your team or uh, the inverse or, um, you know, and, and, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, if you're able to sort of manage those things effectively and really give people within the organization enough license and enough backup, uh, not just to be present, uh, but also to be able to, to really sort of speak up, you know, you're able to uh, uh, sort of hear new thoughts, uh, uh, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, respond uh, with greater dexterity. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, for us, it's it's also really expanded off into you know consultants looking at who our vendors are, uh, you know who our advisors are, and all those things can really help to make your organization more effective. Great. Great, thank you. I'm gonna expand on that when I come back to you, but Hadley, first I'm gonna come to you. You talked about creating an environment where people feel comfortable and welcome. So beyond that though, what other business, or you could talk more about that too, but what other business advantages do you see? Um, specifically when you build an inclusive business? Um, absolutely. I have to say, Jeanette, that in this moment, I don't think there is any risk to running a diverse company. Um, but there is, to me, in my opinion, a huge risk in running a community or a company that is not welcoming and inclusive. Customers are so smart. And especially in this time of social media where it's very hard to fake things, um, they're really putting their money where their beliefs are, and especially when they're shopping with locally owned businesses. Um, yes, we all still order from Amazon, even though we hate that we do it. But when you're walking down the street and you're looking between you know, two different competitors, many customers are going to show the loyalty to the company that reflects their beliefs. So I don't think that there really is any downside to, to be stepping into this moment. Um, the caveat here for me is that it really does need to be real. And I think that that is when a diverse team can help you in these moments. Um, so I just see all the benefits in terms of marketing, PR, um, sales. Um, plus, it just is a, a better way to run your company and it feels better at the end of the day, too. Yeah, thank you. So, Darren, your business specifically designs um, physical spaces for people to congregate and for one reason or another. So in that you have that in common with Hadley in that you're trying to create a place where people feel comfortable and welcome. So could you just talk a little bit more about why the team that you hired is specifically good at that thing? Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, uh, you know, almost all of our work really starts with uh, with listening. You know, it's really about, you know, two years and. And, and one mouth and, and really being able to, um, uh, you know, sort of work with clients to better understand sort of what their definitions of, are, of success might be. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, really looking at sort of what that competitive landscape might look like, who the consumers are that they're looking to try to uh, connect with or win or influence, um, but also for us really looking at uh, what some of their unmet needs, uh, you know, may be. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's it's really sort of inside of you know that synthesis and, and really being able to um, uh, you know both hear uh, you know what's being said uh, to be able to go off and do our own research uh, to really be able to sort of ideate uh, and sort of think about sort of what's possible and you know and and oftentimes uh, you know the work that we produce is fairly uh, bold and different but it's really tough to be able to do those things if you don't have trust and so. You know, and so for us, uh, oftentimes what we're really trying to do is, you know, help our clients to really sort of understand the opportunity that's at hand. In some cases, there might be, uh, you know, markets that might not be obvious uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of what they might have been thinking about. And so our work is really to try to help illuminate that, you know, and then help them to connect with those consumers as effectively as we can, and to both build campaigns, but also to build experiences uh, that back up that promise. Right. Um, Hadley, you said that you come from a business that is traditionally white and male. So how do you go about, it's one thing to want to build a diverse team, but how do you go about doing that if the industry that you're in, which is so specialized to begin with, doesn't have enough people for you to be able to do that successfully? Um, it's it's incredibly hard, and I want to be very transparent about that. We're a ten year old company this year, and um, historically, our well, we've had tons of diversity in terms of people from other countries, LGBTQ, uh, Asian Americans. We so many women that work in the company, um, especially in management positions, and always have. We, even as a black owned company, have struggled to have uh, black people that sell wine in our store. And 
this has been um, historically something that has gotten us so down. Um, and I'd say the first five years of our company, we just sat around and would bemoan the fact that when we put out um, a call for application for a delivery driver, that they would all be black. But when we asked for someone to work on the, on the floor, they would all be white. And about five years ago, we decided that this wasn't going to change unless we started to become part of the change. And we started developing a program, which we actually were able to launch this fall, uh, this spring, um, to develop our own pipeline. And we are working with Boston University to um, develop a, a award program. It's not a scholarship program because for us, this is about access, not about not being able to pay for it. Um, in which they will receive, um, applicants will receive a full wine education, three paid internships on all sides of the wine industry business, um, mentorship with master sommeliers and masters of wine in the city, um, and then our assistance in helping them to find jobs um, at the end of this year long program. And that's just the start for us. You know, this will be one or two people a year, um, people of color a year that will be able to go through this program to start. But we also know that we will be doing online seminars and things like that. We know that we now have to draw the line in the sand and create our own pipeline and change the industry to be what we want to see it. Um, and it took us a long time to get the clout to be able to be there, not to mention the money to be able to fund some of these things. But that to us was our ultimate goal. If you're not seeing the type of workforce that you want, you have to take a stand and go out there and create it yourself. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for telling us that. Um, Darren, you said before that you, your culture at, at your company is two ears, one mouth. Um, and you and I talked about this the other day and I loved this conversation because it was something I hadn't really thought about before, which is that I always think about the importance of diversity and inclusion is that you have all these voices, all these different voices. And I never once thought about it as being important because as you taught me or told me that you have people listening differently. So could you talk more about that, about how the value of having people who are hearing things and listening differently to your clients? Um, because I thought that was just such an interesting perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that listening is so much more important <laughs> than what it is that you have to say. And, uh, you know, although sometimes it isn't always as, as satisfying. Uh, you know, I, I would say that for us, um, you know, you know, we're uh, oftentimes at the end of a brief, uh, sitting around the table and asking everyone sort of both what do they hear, you know, both in terms of you know, what's being said, but also what's be remaining unsaid. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and also sort of asking, um, you know, sort of what do we take as a, as a suite of next steps? And, uh, you know, and so, if, you know, if you're a writer or if you're a designer or a copywriter or a project manager, uh, you know, being able to sort of think about uh, sort of, you know, what it is that we ne really need to do in order to, uh, you know, get that client um, uh, to the win that they are, are, are looking to achieve. You know, I, I would say that, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, the ways in which we really try to uh, encourage this, you know, it's, it's everything from, uh, uh, you know, the conversations that we're having internally, it's uh, sort of the values that we've really tried to build, it's, uh, you know, the speakers that we invite uh, to come in to present to the team, it's uh, sort of ways in which we really try to practice mindfulness as an organization. Uh, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, a lot of it is really about sort of how do we connect with each other uh, on a daily basis and uh, wanting to ensure that, you know, everyone in the team, uh, you know, feels like they are uh, seen, heard and valued. Uh, you know, and then also really looking at how we can then begin to sort of express that out, uh, you know, to clients and anyone else, that, you know, that we're, that we're looking to interact with. Yeah. Thank you. Hadley, um, one more for you. Uh, we talked, you mentioned social media a little bit before, and as you said, you can't fake it on social media. Um, so how do you go about using social media to to talk about diversity and inclusion, but in a way that's genuine and real? 
Absolutely. Um, I think that we are in the middle of proof positive that social media can just be a complete disaster with this chat poll challenge accepted moment that we are in with, you know, yesterday it was all black and white photos and today it's all apologies for not understanding why they put black and white photos on. Um, you know, if you are not invested in having a transparent and honest conversation on social media, you're just gonna get yourself into so much trouble so fast. And I think we saw that with the black squares on July 2nd or whatever it was. I think we saw it again yesterday. Um, so I think that the most important thing to do with social media is to pause, take a breath, really think about what you're saying if you're not sure how to say something, if you're not sure something is bringing true, you need to consult with people who don't look like you or think like you and ask for help. You're not supposed to be an expert. You don't need to be an expert on all of these things. Um, and to, to take all that in mind, but also not to hide. I think, especially in the wine um, and spirits industry right now, there are a lot of people that are just trying to ride this out and keep their heads down and hope that nobody notices that they're just trying to ride it out. And believe me, everybody notices. You can't ride these moments in time out. You need to lean into them, but you just need to lean into them in an honest and transparent way. That's great. Um, Darren, I have one last question for you, but I just, I wonder if you had any thoughts on that topic instead. So do you have any thoughts about the social media and just marketing in general? and how to communicate your, your, that on that? Yeah, you know, I, I, would, I would echo, um, you know, many of Hadley's points, uh, you know, and, um, you know, we live in this environment right now where we're, uh, you know, uber connected, uh, you know, consumers have never been more empowered uh, than they are today. Uh, and, you know, if, um, you know, if someone uh, suspects that you're a fraud, um, you know, they're going to call bullshit and probably blow you up on social. Uh, so, you know, so it, these aren't things that you can fake. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, for anyone uh, who's interested in lasting and meaningful change uh, inside of these organizations, you know, the first part of it is, you know, starting with an honest assessment. You know, I think, uh, you know, like anything in business, uh, you know, if it's not something you're measuring, then it's probably not something that you have put a real priority on. And, uh, and so I would say, you know, understanding what your baseline is, understanding where it is that you're looking to be in six months, 12 months, a year from now, uh, you know, and, uh, and really being able to look at sort of uh, what are some of the things that you can do? Um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, diversity looks different in a uh, side of different spaces, spaces, uh, much like Hadley and TJ. You know, we're also in a space um, where, um, you know, Black people are chronically underrepresented and design and in advertising and, you know, even in, you know, some of the spaces that we enter into on the consumer side. And so it's, you know, really been with, um, you know, with some of our relationships, uh, you know, and in some cases, these are sponsoring organizations that might make an introduction or, uh, you know, might be willing to sort of back you up in one way or another, you know, and, and I would say that, you know, those types of events really can be transformative. Uh, you know, uh, you know, particularly um, when, um, you know, when you're looking to build new relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Darren and Hadley. I will come back to you, I'm sure, during the Q&A as well. Um, so it's time for the audience Q&A. But before I do that, I would like for all of us to just get a little bit of a feeling for what our audience is thinking. So we did that word cloud earlier and we asked people, um, you know, what is driving their inclusion efforts? So I would like to see what kinds of words we are getting, fairness, equity. Community, I think is a big one that um, we've all touched on in one way or another because to build a community, right? You have to, you have to create one around yourself first. Um, okay, that's great. So um, I also, every week we've been asking the audience, um, we just wanted to try to keep getting an idea of where they are in terms of phases of reopening. So the audience, you can vote now um, on the right-hand side of your screen to just tell us um, 
how would you characterize your business right now? So we're going to do this in real time. So are you closed, partially open, completely open, or open but remote? Um, okay. That's good to see that not many, no one's closed. That's good. Oh, I spoke too soon. Okay. Okay. So I think it's pretty clear that everybody's in some state of reopening. So that's great. So thank you to all four of you. I'm going to go ahead and move us to the audience Q and A. Um, I'm going to start with a, a question at pretty high on the list. Um, and Tiffany, I, I think I'm going to ask this question of you. Um, so in a historically straight white male profession, what steps might you suggest for fostering an inclusive environment um, for a group that's underrepresented in the organization? Yeah, this is a great question. So what the approach that we take with our clients is um, authenticity and voices. So, and I love how Darren, you uh, walked through voices and listening. Um, and what typically happens is people don't use their voice. So the organization and the culture might be listening, but people don't use their voice. And so um, what the steps that, that we create are, if, if, if this is what you're actually up against in your organization today, that this is a leadership issue and the, it takes courage. If you're not on the leadership team, it takes courage to create a meeting and a conversation with the leadership team as a whole or with one ally you have on your leadership team and, and, and lay it out, explain it, let them know how you're feeling and let them know what you're experiencing because companies right now, everyone's in a pivot and there is a, you know, there is this thing going around where, oh, they don't listen. They're not going to listen because they're up against financial or long term, short term um, uh, wins uh, or adjustments. And the reality is we work with a lot of leaders in companies of all different sizes. And every leader says we never hear anything. No one ever shares anything with us. And it seems like it's always us creating programs or retreats or workshops or inviting in speakers or consultants. And really, they're waiting for you to say something as well. So the first thing we say is use your voice. It is a leadership issue. If this is what you're experiencing in specific to that question, that it takes courage and you're not going to get fired. <laughs> you're not going to get fired for using your voice and have the conversation either with them collectively, if you work in a small business, or find an ally on that team and open up the conversation. This is, I feel, underrepresented in these areas. So get specific with what it is, not just a general, I feel underrepresented, get specific in meetings, in leads, in campaign, whatever it is that's going on in your business. So the number one thing that we create the space for our clients is to use your voice and speak up um, because leaders are listening. Right. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, Michelle, you talked a little bit before about maintaining the feeling of being included, especially during this time. So this person says, how um, how can you effectively t team build in an era when everybody's working from home, especially since there's like a loss of connection? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, to be honest, in the beginning, it was a little bit of a struggle for me, too. Um, but I will just say that, you know, don't be afraid to be creative. Um, we have different topics that we like to cover and sometimes it has nothing to do with the business. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we also pass the baton. So we'll let others bring other topics to the meeting so that it's not the same person driving the conversation each time. Um, but, you know, most people think of team building as like, oh, what can we do away from the office, you know, so that we can get to know each other better? Well, when you, you know, might be a little bit more creative on how folks can get to know one another, especially, like you said, we are working from home and there might be photographs of people behind you or your pet might be walking around. Um, you know, don't be afraid to have some kind of show and tell about like what's going on in your life working from home. 
Um, and even just, you know, set little goals for folks to where, you know, people aren't used to sitting necessarily at their home office or their kitchen table, or some people are working off of their couch, um, you know, stretching, walking. Most people feel like they're working more now than they were when they had the office. So um, the gyms are closed. People aren't able to get any exercise, but they definitely need to walk around their house or around their perimeter of their house. So I would just say, get creative and, and, and make that a fun time for your folks. If you don't have Zoom, you know, try FaceTime, um, but there's so many Google Meets, there's so many resources out there for you online, and I would say take advantage of them. Great, thanks. Um, Darren, um, ha this person is asking about how you go about recruiting and retaining diverse teams of people, employees. So I would ask Javi, but I feel like Javi, you were very specific already. So I'd like you, Darren, to tell us. Um, more specifically, how do you go about finding people to join your team who you think represent diverse backgrounds? Yeah, I would say the first part of it is making sure that it's clear to everyone that it's a priority. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and being able to actually talk about some of these things, you know, not just in terms of, you know, a job description, but you know, uh, you know, if we're looking to diversify the team, we don't hire any and we don't interview any diverse candidates, you know, then your chances are zero. Um, so, you know, so, you know, kind of designing sort of the, uh, you know, the process so that uh, you're able to uh, look at a more diverse field. I would say that, you know, thinking about uh, sort of uh, where jobs are placed, uh, you know, if these are uh, roles for people who are at an earlier stage in their career, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that you connect to uh, you know, uh, alumni groups, uh, you know, that might uh, have served a diverse population, uh, sort of being intentional around, you know, professional organizations or, you know, other types uh, of affinity organizations, um, you know, that oftentimes will be able to, uh, you know, share job listings. Uh, you know, I would say that sort of making the things that you value as an organization uh, sort of front and center in, in terms of uh, you know, those jobs, job descriptions, I would say that, um, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of looking at ways in which uh, your organization can really be uh, ready, uh, you know, so that um, uh, the experience that employees have, uh, you know, is something that they really uh, feel like they're able to connect with uh, and are looking and are able to uh, uh, advance within. Um, you know, I, I would also say that, you know, uh, you know, exit interviews can be just as effective as interviews on the front line in terms of getting smarter about sort of what worked, uh, you know, and what could work even better the next go around. Um, you know, and, and I, I would also say that, you know, people within your organization uh, can also really be uh, great resources, you know, so if you, if you don't have the answer, ask for help. And I would be much more committed to uh, to getting it right than, than being right. Yeah, thank you. So that's something both you and Hadley both said is, you know, be sure to ask other people for help. Hadley, I have a question for you from someone else in the wine industry. Um, so they say, any advice for solopreneurs, so people who don't have employees, on how to best engage customers and create a community with a focus on um, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Absolutely. Um, I don't have that much specific experience in the wine world of not having a team around me, but I think that much of what I said in the beginning would hold true, whether you are part of a one person company or, you know, part of Constellation Brands, um, which is one of the largest beverage uh, businesses in the world. And that is that it's not just about the team of people that you have around you. It's about the services that you're offering it's about your customers, it's about your products. So let's say that you are um, a solopreneur who is doing wine tasting events in someone's home or virtually in this moment. Um, how great would it be to dig deep and find undiscovered regions, undiscovered winemakers, black winemakers, women winemakers, winemakers from very unknown parts of the world and focus on those for some of your um, tastings. 
yes, they're, the wines are harder to find, but the knowledge is there and the, the wines won't be harder to find if we start sharing that kind of information. Um, so I think it just really comes down to always looking at what you're offering and making sure that that has a lot of diversity and inclusion within it, even if you can't have a team around you that is diverse. Thank you. Michelle, I'm coming back to you. Um, so what are the first two or three things a company needs to do if it's really focusing on diversity and inclusion thoughtfully, purposely for the first time? And what should they not be doing? Well, um, you should definitely be intentional when you're building your candidate slate. Um, I know that it was mentioned earlier that um, you know, you're, you're not going to get diverse um, employees, unless you're intentional about who you're who you're interviewing, um, and I think it's perfectly fine to have diversity and inclusion goals for your company. Um, if you're underrepresented in certain areas, then you should have a goal on what that what you want that to look like, and the goal should be for everyone in the company, regardless of what position or role they play. Everyone should have that goal intertwined, whether you're in marketing or you're in sales, or you're in support, um, everybody should own the goal so that it's the same strategy for everybody in the company. Um, and I would just say, don't expect things to change unless you have a plan, a clear plan that is that can be executed, that can be, that can be explained, um, that others understand it well, and that, um, you know, that you take the time to to, you know, if, if quarterly the company goes through and, and, and talks about um, revenues and how the company's doing, um, they should also use this as a measurement and track it and talk about it on a quarterly basis, just as much as they do their earnings. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, Tiffany, this person says, what can we say, um, it could be on social media, it could be to their own employees or to their customers that doesn't sound like they cut and paste it from some, from some recommended list of things to say. Um, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot because I'm not 100 percent clear, but meaning um, say in what regard? I think that they're just I'm guessing, but I think what they're saying is how do they be genuine in communicating either internally or externally their intentions? without sounding like they're just copying and pasting something that everybody else has already posted. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, yeah, and that it kind of ties into another question I'm seeing here is when will we stop talking about this as a corporate program and start living this as a lifestyle? And the, the real piece that we start with is authenticity um, and getting, getting in as a team and getting clear on what it is we want to create. So we always start with defining where you are and moving into the, the vision of what you want to cause and create. If you're not playing that game, it doesn't matter what you say, what, what you post, what you print, how you connect with your colleagues and your customers. If you're not all on the same page and this doesn't matter to everyone, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it, it feels manufactured just like the social media uh, conversations that Hadley and, Darren shared. So it's it's really about commitment. What is your company committed to? And what are you individually committed to creating? And, and, and again, what I said in the earlier question is don't wait. There, the waiting around is causing nothing. So when you have the courage to come in and disrupt, cause change, cause transformation in inclusivity, diversity, equity, whatever it is, the pivot, the fear that might be underlying um, in the organization, you cause what gets to happen. So the copy paste to me sounds like there might be a step missing with being in communication and in relationship with everyone in your company and being connected to what the company's vision is. What are we up to? What do we stand for? And what does that look like and sound like? And when that is when that's created, there are no copy and paste. That that's just what we're up to. 
Right, right. Um, Darren, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought maybe you looked like you wanted to answer this question as well. Did you have any <laughs> thoughts? I, I thought, I thought like, did you no. have any thoughts on this topic of how to be genuine about this and not just paying lip service to it? Yeah, you know, and in many in many ways it's it's really kind of building on some of the points that Tiffany was making. Um, you know, I, I think that if you're struggling with this, uh, you know, it may not be you may not have fully uh, have gotten clear on sort of what it is that you value, uh, you know, and I would say that, uh, you know, if you were able to do that as an organization, um, from there, it's, it's, it's much easier to start to figure out sort of what the voice of your organization wants to be in terms of, you know, how you uh, speak about uh, your services, how you sort of address the public, how you talk about sort of more difficult topics, uh, you know, like some of these. And so I, I would say that, you know, the first piece of it is uh, is getting clear on, you know, on those values. And then from there, you can really start to figure out, you know, sort of what your spin is on a particular mm -hmm. issue or the types of actions that you're looking to take uh, or how to do anything else um, with real credibility. You know, and I would say that the, the other piece of it, for me at least, uh, is that, um, you know, I've often, times found that um, when one is making decisions quickly, uh, you know, and whether that's as a consumer or whether as an entrepreneur, you're trying to fill a hole uh, within your company, uh, sort of the most immediate reflex is to, um, is to uh, go with someone or somebody uh, that you know and like, uh, you know, and so I would say that you're really being intentional on sort of building relationships before you actually need them. Uh, can also be really helpful, uh, both in terms of, you know, uh, sort of building that pipeline, uh, in terms of sort of figuring out how to talk about something more effectively, um, you know, and, you know, that you're not just, uh, you know, sort of reacting uh, when issues come up, you know, that you really are able to, um, you know, to, to draw on e enough resources in order to be able to manage that diversity that we're all looking to achieve. Thank you. I we are right at the very end, but Hadley, do if you could give advice on this in like thirty seconds. This person says they're looking to <laughs> no pressure. They're looking to um, create a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, and so, what advice would you give Hadley to a small business that's looking to start that? Like, how many people? Just any advice in thirty seconds or less. <laughs> Okay, I can do this. So one thing that is important to remember is we're small businesses, we're quick, we're nimble, we're able to pivot. That is our superpower. We don't have to go to board and, and these things prove. If you are too small, a small business to be able to generate this yourself, go to other small businesses in your area, in your community and start one together. And the last thing that I would say is please don't think, um, which is happening to my husband quite a bit right now, that you can just install one black person in as your diversity um, committee. Uh, you cannot ask one person to speak for the varied opinions that need to be part of a DEI committee. If you don't have them, work together with your all other small businesses to find them and start a committee together. Thank you so much. That was really great advice. So we are totally out of time. So I want to thank all of you, Michelle, Tiffany, Darren, and Hadley. Thank you very, very much. I thought this was great. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business, as well as our supporting sponsors, ADP, FedEx, MetLife, and Square. And thanks to our chamber partner, the Greater Boston Chamber, for helping us pull off this event. And most of all, thank you so much to our audience for joining us. Uh, please join us again in two weeks on Wednesday, August 12th. We will be discussing how entrepreneurs can start a new business or create new lines of business during the pandemic. And for that event, we're teaming up with the Detroit Regional Chamber, and we will be highlighting businesses from that area. In the meantime, check out the great resources from Chase for Business and the U.S. Chamber and Co. Uh, that are located on the bottom of your screen. Um, and together we will get through this and we will rebuild. We will see you again in two weeks. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.